Today I am going to speak about the doctrine of colorable legislation. It is used in white terms in several judgments, but it is a very interesting and a slightly technical subject which requires some understanding by providing examples. Now what is this colorable legislation and the doctrine of colorable legislation? Where the Supreme Court has held that the Parliament of the Legislature did not have the competence to enact the Act and they are colorable legislations and therefore declared it to be void and ultra-virus the Constitution. Now the question of colorable legislation is actually the question of competence of the Legislature or the Parliament to enact the law. Under the Constitution, the Parliament or the State Legislature can enact Acts with regards to the entries that are mentioned in the lists provided in the 7th Schedule. The 7th Schedule provides for three lists, that is the Union List, the State List and the Concurrent List, where the Parliament has the exclusive power to enact laws with regards to the entries mentioned in List 1, that is the Union List, whereas the State and the Parliament both can enact laws with regards to the entries mentioned in list that is the concurrent list, whereas the state legislature can enact laws with regards to the entries mentioned in the state list. Now the constitution provides for certain limitations with regards to the powers of the parliament or the state legislature with regards to enactment of the laws. Now there are two limitations which the parliament or the state legislature has to ensure before enacting a law that it has to come within its power to enact the law with respect to the lists mentioned in the 7th schedule and second it should not violate any of the provisions of the constitution and more particularly part 3 of the constitution. So with regards to the competence of the legislature, sometimes an act are directly or manifestly violating or transgressing the limits prescribed under the constitution and with regards to these direct or manifest transgression the supreme court would clearly declare such enactments to be void or ultra-virus or unconstitutional. There are cases where the transgression of the limits or competence of the legislature would be covert, disguised or indirect. And it is with regards to these indirect means by which the legislature is contemplating to pass an act where the expression colorable legislation comes into picture. And it is with regards to this that the form and the structure of the act will have to be determined and it is not the object which alone will have to be seen because the object will always appear to be in accordance with the constitutional mandate and the provisions of the constitution. However, its effect would sometimes be that it would violate or transgress the limitations prescribed under the constitution and it is with regards to such transgression which are indirect, covert or which are in a disguised manner where this expression will come into picture. Now with regards to the first limitation on the power of the parliament or the state legislature, the question of colorable legislation arises and the Supreme Court in the landmark judgment of state of Bihar versus Kameshwar Singh has for the first time held that the provision of the Bihar Land Reforms Act of 1950 was a piece of colorable legislation and was a fraud on the constitution. Now to understand the provisions of this Bihar Land Reforms Act. The act was enacted in order to abolish the zamindari system and to provide for land reforms and also to redistribute the land acquired from these zamindars and redistribute it to the peasants and the farmers. Now this was a very important socio-economic policy of the government of that time. But in order to acquire the property, Article 31 Clause 2 of the Constitution provided that the person whose properties were to be acquired could be acquired only for public purpose and also compensation had to be paid to such persons. Now these acts were enacted under entry 42 of list 3 which read the principles on which compensation for property acquired or requisition for purposes of the union or of a state or for any other public purpose is to be determined and the form and manner in which such compensation is to be given. Now with respect to this entry, section 4 of the Bihar Land Reforms Act provided that all areas of rent, royalties and cesses which had already accrued due to the landlord prior to the date of vesting shall vest in the state and the state would pay only 50% of these areas to the landlord. 
Now this provision was under consideration before the Supreme Court in this matter. And the Supreme Court interpreting this provision held that this provision in real terms deprived the landlords, the zamindars of the actual compensation and the state government would be taking the arrears of rent which were due to the landlords before the date of vesting of the said lands under the act. So therefore what the state was doing was taking the revenue of the landlords and from that revenue was paying 50% of that revenue to the landlords as compensation. So therefore the Supreme Court interpreting this provision said that the taking the whole and returning the half meant nothing more or less than taking the half without any return and this was held could not be regarded as a principle of compensation in any sense of the word. So interpreting section 4 with entry 42 of list 3 which provided for principles on which compensation for property acquired had to be determined, the Supreme Court held that this taking of the arrears of rent does not in any manner determine the principles on which the compensation of property is to be determined. The Supreme Court held that though this act appears to have been passed under entry 42 of list 3, in reality it does not determine any of the principles on which the compensation for property acquired is determined and therefore taking of the arrears of the rent due to the landlords does not in any manner come within the purview of entry 42 of list 3 and therefore this provision of the act is a colorable piece of legislation and held this act to be invalid and ultra-virus the constitution on the ground that it is a colorable legislation and as a fraud on the constitution. The Supreme Court further held that the government lacked funds for the payment of even the illusory compensation provided for in the act and accordingly hit upon the device of acquiring these arrears on payment of only 50% of their value as provided in section 24. Raising funds for augmenting the treasury could not be regarded as a public purpose such as would justify expropriation of private property. The Supreme Court held that an entry concerning payment of compensation in no sense includes legislative power of non-payment of compensation. The whole purpose of this head of legislation is to provide payment of compensation and not the confiscation of property. And therefore what this provision did was to confiscate the property and not pay the actual compensation which was entitled to the person whose properties were acquired. And therefore the Supreme Court held this provision of the act to be ultra-virus and a colorable piece of legislation. So I hope by way of this example, the concept of doctrine of colorable legislation can be understood in easy and simple manner.